to FO Talks. I'm Peter Isaacson, Fair Observer's Chief Strategy Officer. Today I'm joined by retired General A.K. Singh, a top rank commander of India's tank forces with unparalleled experience in military hardware and strategy. He was also Lieutenant Governor of two provinces and now serves in various contexts as a strategic uh, analyst. His 40 year military career led him to collaborate at different times with Soviet, NATO, and even post-Soviet Russian commands, offering him a wide perspective on the military dramas of our day, and particularly the two and a half year old war of attrition in Ukraine. So, A.K. Singh, welcome to Fair Observer. Thank you, Peter. What a pleasure to be with you, a man of your strategic standing. Uh, I concur that we are at a very critical stage in this conflict. But as my opening statement, let me give an overview which we, before we focus on the present issues. So, Peter, in my view, this is a conflict that should not have been the root issues have been known to both sides since the end of Cold War. But international centers of compellence have forced the conflict. U.S. neocons and a subservient EU stroke NATO on one side, Russia on the other. Ukraine is just the means caught and is being devastated. Western mass media has been driving the narrative so far and social media giants have been forced to take sides. The issue of morality and HR violations is a central theme, but the duplicity is stark. How is a Ukrainian life more precious than a life in Palestine, Afghanistan, Syria, or Libya? The global South, may I say, is not party to the conflict and bulk of the world's population is more balanced in their view of this conflict. Geoeconomics has emerged as important, as important as geopolitics and sanctions as a potent tool, but are double-edged. If you have a resilient economy and as Atul of Fair Observer says, a fortress economy like Russia's, then uh, you can be resilient. There are lessons for India, especially with reference to self-reliance in key defense technologies and manufacturing. From an Indian perspective, we have many suitors, not a bad position to be in, and thus far we have played our cards pragmatically. Both the Prime Minister and Foreign Minister have kept Indian interests to the fore. So here I am, Atul, to give you whatever you throw at me to answer that. All yours, sir. All right. Well, I, I totally agree with you about how this, this war we've been talking about for two and a half years could have been avoided. I think uh, a lot of people have gone over this. I know, and I totally agree with you, that the media in the West has refused to discuss it in terms of the actual history. Um, so what's interesting now is that some of the um, so, some of some of the uh, things that people were saying and seem to be concerned about are becoming clearer today. The war has reached a critical stage. We're now waiting on this particular day to understand whether the Western coalition. Of NATO, uh, the US and UK in particular, will decide to use long range weapon to authorize the use of long range Western whip weapons against uh, Russia. Uh, I, I'll ask you this first question as a, as a military man. Is this a significant step if it takes place, if it's authorized? And if it is significant, how significant would it be? Well, I would say it's a critical juncture. And so far, while many countries in Europe have been clamoring for this, 
the Americans have been rather cautious yeah. because they are aware of what Russia is a holder of the largest nuclear stockpile. Their nuclear doctrine is quite clear that if you threaten Russia, then they will use all means at their disposal. Slowly, if I may say, with great uh, apprehension, slowly we are creeping towards an actual red line. Till now, the red lines were not that significant. And I think at least Russia has been quite restrained in its response to those crossing of those red lines. But if long-range missiles, long-range bombs start raining on Moscow in the garb of saying that you are attacking their military targets, then I think Russia will be with its back to the wall and there will be great pressure on the hierarchy in Russia to take significant steps to neutralize this. And we all know what those steps are. So from a personal assessment point of view, I am still hopeful that better sense will prevail and the delusion in which some of us are living, uh, we will take a step back from that. We are creeping towards a very serious situation. Yes, that's certainly the impression everyone gets. And it's very difficult to talk about it today, this particular day, because we don't know what decision is finally going to be announced. And then we won't know what the follow-up would be, whether that is actually translated into action. The other question I have in my mind, I don't know if you can answer it, but I'd love to have your opinion on it, is that everything that happens today uh, in the US uh, and obviously has a, a direct bearing on everything that's concerned with uh, Biden's commitment to this war uh, is linked to the outcome of the election in November. To what extent are the actions today that people are taking, the decisions they're making, and then the actions they'll take in the next two months are influenced by the election? I have a personal opinion or a feeling that maybe uh, everything is designed to prolong the war until November and then to look possibly for a solution because uh, you may know that the Wall Street Journal reported that they're now talking about um, winding up the war, that, uh, they, that uh, everyone has recognized that Ukraine cannot win the war. So where does that leave us? We've got an election coming. We've got decisions being made today. We have actions that will be planned at least for the next two months. Is there any kind of perspective that makes any sense to you? I think, uh, Peter, I agree with you. Because that event, the election in the United States, has a overbearing influence on what is happening and what is likely to happen, including this decision that is taken today. Pragmatically, logically, they should not take a decision to authorize the use of Western equipment to hit Russia deep inside. But if in their assessment, this is going to give a leg up to the present administration and their party, then they may take a controlled step. I personally feel that pragmatism will still and caution will still play its part. And as I read, even the uh, powers that be in the United States are divided. I'm told that MOD, Ministry of Defense, and the Pentagon are against such a decision. Whereas the State Department and the intelligence agencies are pushing it. In fact, I'm quite surprised that the head of one of your premier intelligence agencies, Mr. Burns, he understands Russia very well. And he has written in the past about Russian red line. And now we are talking of a catastrophic series of events. 
I hope with just two, three months left for the elections, a pragmatic approach would be adopted by America. Europe really will fall in line with whatever America decides. And Zelensky is not a player in such decisions. He may shout at the top of his voice, but to everyone, at least in the South, global South, he appears delusional. For example, you talk of the Kursk invasion. You talk of the F-16s coming to Ukraine. They are not going to make a difference to the outcome of this conflict. The bottom line is, Peter, in my assessment, everybody understands it, that Russia cannot be defeated. The point is, how much of its objectives will it achieve? And will the war come to an end before it does that? There is uh, ambiguity about what its final end state and objectives are at the moment. Certainly capture of the Donbass and ensuring that in any negotiation, there is foolproof guarantee that NATO will not expand into Ukraine. I think these are two critical issues. Yes. Uh, now, I'm, you, you, you say that um, everyone understands that Ukraine cannot defeat Russia. Uh, and even that's uh, uh, an interesting question. What does it mean to defeat Russia? Does it mean simply to push Russia back to where it was? Or does it mean to undermine the, the, the current system and the current regime and to achieve some kind of regime change, which seemed to have been the objective of the US. They didn't want to admit it outright, but it came out in a lot of different uh, discourses. My question is this, you say that everyone understands it, but the Western press is still saying victory is possible. In the debate the other night, um, the journalist who was interviewing, uh, the, who was interviewing the two candidates um, tried to press uh, Trump on the idea that you must be committed to winning the war. And, and just this week, uh, Tony Blinken actually said, we're out to win the war. So it, there's a bit of a contradiction in what we see and what you said, which I totally agree with, that anyone who's observing this closely knows that it's impossible for Ukraine to win. So where does that leave us psychologically? And again, this is has an impact on the election, but this is a, a very complex situation in terms of the way that the media will talk about it and the way officials will talk about it. I, I agree with you. Uh, I am not a specialist on Russia, but I spent a year in Russia in their tank academy at the height of the cold. And then I've been associated with their equipment and I've visited Russia. I understand their psyche very well. And one thing which everybody got wrong was that there will be angst against the hierarchy, Mr. Putin, for example. But all this war has done is to get the people to line up behind him. Please go back to World War II. Stalin had committed such horrendous atrocities on the Russian population. But once the German blitzkrieg reached the gates of Leningrad and Moscow, the people forgot that and fell in line to defend their motherland. So I think uh, whatever delusions the West may be looking at, uh, I think uh, they need to be more realistic. PSYOPs is one thing. Well, you can say something to get an advantage uh, using PSYOPs. But I think hard-nosed discussions and deliberations need to be done. And more important, Peter, I feel that the kind of criticality that is developing today, there needs to be at least backdoor channels that should be working, talking to each other, especially Russia and America. The rest don't matter. And uh, this war, let me also state, everybody should realize that like most conflicts, 
this conflict will also end up on a negotiating table. And the solutions will be found there. There is jockeying for favorable positions. I understand that. But uh, in the bargain, we should not create a critical situation. Uh, there again, I have to agree with you and then ask a further question because it's obvious that any conflict is going to end with some kind of negotiation. But the impression that's being established, I would say, uh, not just given, but established uh, with Washington is that diplomacy is surrender. It's appeasement. Uh, you don't you, you don't negotiate anything. You just push until you get some kind of military outcome, really, uh, which I find very strange because all the wars that in my lifetime since Vietnam uh, have just ended in with no negotiations. I mean, there were phases of negotiations in Vietnam, but the war itself was prolonged until it just somebody lost it or, or, or the US gave up doing what it promised to do for 20 years. Um, so what's the situation now? Because we've we've uh, negotiations itself has been given bad press. And that came out, as I said, in the question that was asked to Trump. You don't negotiate, you win a war. You, you don't end a war. And Trump made the very reasonable statement that I want this war to end and I will do right things that are required to do it, which is the perfectly reasonable, normal, rational uh, thing to say. Uh, but he was criticized for it because he was not committed to the American side. So do you, how do you see, uh, what, what I, what really intrigues me is that you talk about negotiations and you talked about US and Russia. Well, who is actually going to negotiate? Is it in the U.S. is it Putin and Biden or Putin and somebody else, whether it's Trump or, or Harris, it was going to sit down and say, OK, let's work this out. Or is it Zelensky, who is no longer president, by the way, and people don't, may, may not be aware of this, but his term ended in, in May of this year. Um, who is who? How, how can you imagine? How can you envisage? Uh, a negotiation in the coming months or year? Uh, Peter, a few uh, key issues. One is that there used to be some basic trust between the two superpowers, US and Russia. That trust seems to have vanished, if not completely, to a large extent over the last two, three decades, ever since NATO started creeping eastwards. And I think presently the first thing that needs to be established is a little more trust. After the Minsk Accords were broken, not progressed, and the statement of Angela Merkel that we went for those accords only to buy time. So Russia will be cautious. Russia will be rather cautious. And it is quite clear that Mr. Zelensky is uh, not a legal president anymore, and he will fall in line with what U.S. decides, as he did during the Istanbul talks. So I feel that um, what uh, stage we will move from this conflict to negotiation is hard to predict at the moment. But I think uh, the next few months are going to be critical for Ukraine because of its limited capacity to continue to fight this war. They are suffering on all counts and a stage may come uh, if their defense collapses, then I don't know how we will proceed for, further. Okay, so how do, you, uh, how do you read the Kursk invasion? in the light of what you've just been describing, because it, obviously Ukraine is weakened. Uh, everyone seems, uh, we use everyone in quotes because everyone who's not officially in the, uh, speaking to the media from the State Department uh, is, uh, is saying uh, that uh, Ukraine is in a very 
critical situation now. The Kursk, Kursk invasion took place a, a month ago. It's still, yeah. they're still there. Uh, how is that evolving? How might that evolve? And was it a mistake? Or was it a right. breakthrough? Uh, first, there is no clarity as to who was the backbone planner of this invasion. Was it the West or was it solely confined to Ukraine? I refuse to believe that Ukraine could do such an act, uh, such a risky venture without backing from the West. They have committed their crack troops, their strategic reserves into this offensive and they had gained some initial surprises. So presently the situation is that while tactically they have made some gains, taken PWs, captured 1,000 square kilometers, they are holding 25, 30 settlements. But operationally and strategically, this has put them in a very difficult situation. As I understand, there is no coherent defense line which they can hold. And the Russians, their main objective, uh, of course, they achieved a initial objective of raising morale, of taking to the offensive. But their main objective of diluting the Russian offensive in Donbass did not work because as I understand the Russians, they don't look at tactics. They focus on operations and operational art and strategy. And that dictated to them that Kursk is something they can let it be and deal in their own time. It's just 0.007% of Russia. And they know that sooner than later, the Ukrainians will be driven out as per Russian sources. And I'm talking, you know, the best inputs that you are getting today is from bloggers both on both sides. I think that's uh, quite... Uh, remarkable. And as per them, I think the Ukrainians who probably committed seven, eight brigades, uh, 15, 20,000 troops, the Russians are claiming to have neutralized over 10,000, over 100 tanks and other various kinds of equipment. And today, as I understand, the Ukrainians are holding small defensive positions, widely separated. There is no coherent defense line because if they get together, they'll get decimated by the firepower that the Russians enjoy. The Russians have so far only brought in troops from outside and their focus seems to be to use both direct and indirect fire, more of indirect fire, both air and ground, to decimate the Ukrainians. Simultaneously, they are also cutting off their logistic lifeline. And um, sooner and later, Ukraine will find it difficult to replenish and sustain the forces that they have. In my view, as a uh, military observer, I would say they have made a mistake, which is often committed by people who don't think it through. That means they did not clearly see what is the end state in the Kursk invasion and what will happen after a month when they have now the Russians have started responding. So as I see, uh, the Ukrainians have three options. One is to dig in where they are, and sooner than later, they will lose their logistic supply line and they will slowly be decimated. Second is to withdraw to a shallower kind of a shallower kind of bridgehead which they can hold. And third is to slowly save whatever troops they can because of the denuding of troops from Donbass, opposite Donbass, has greatly weakened them there. And that's where they need to hold. If Pokorovsk falls, which is the critical logistic hub, I don't know what is their next defense line till they reach the Dnieper River. So the ball is in the court of 
the West and the Ukrainians, and they need to figure out what to do. It, this invasion has certainly not given them any operational or strategic advantage. And today, uh, most analysts in the West, including some media, are beginning to recognize and reiterate this fact. Yes. Um, the other day, where well, about a week ago, the Financial Times organized a, 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 an extraordinary meeting between the head of MI6 and the head of the CIA, William Burns. And uh, what, what struck me is that they were both asked to justify the Kursk invasion, and they put the best face on it that they could by saying that uh, it was, I, I, I can't remember exactly how they said it, but they said it gave a boost to morale. And in yes. fact, it's something in what uh, Moore said that uh, struck me. He said, to some degree, in the way he, he formulated, and I thought, that gives the whole game away. He doesn't believe it. Yes, uh, Peter, he came out much more direct and cognizant of what is happening. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, the head of MI6 was more pragmatic in his assessment of this. Without... More pra pragmatic than William Burns, is that what yes, you're saying? absolutely. Yeah. Because Mr. Burns is a very senior and experienced uh, man, um, I think uh, was following a particular line which they wanted to, probably to boost the morale of the Ukrainians and to convince them that don't give up, we are there for you. Uh, one of the things which the Americans have succeeded so far in is to uh, give that um, reassurance to Ukraine that they are there. Unfortunately, while that reassurance may be true, Ukraine continues to suffer. In my view, Peter, Every nation, the hierarchy of every nation has a, his first responsibility is to protect the interests of its own country. And you can see in this whole Gamut, Americans, they are, uh, let's say, trying to denude the Russians with very least cost to themselves. That's why this war is continuing. If there was a cost like in Afghanistan, Vietnam, Iraq, this war would have ended. So at the moment, it is something the Americans can live with. Russia is absolutely cognizant of the critical nature of what is happening and how it impacts the strategic interests of Russia. I have so far failed to understand how the hierarchy in Ukraine is trying to protect the interests of its own people. Half a million dead, millions have left the country. The country is devastated. And look at what you are fighting for. You are fighting for Donbass, where majority of people want to be with Russia. It's not as though they have come. So I think uh, it's kind of strange. And uh, sometimes you feel bad for what the Ukrainian people are going through. Uh, yes, that, they're the, the forgotten members of the, this, this drama uh, because we're so focused on who's going to win and who, who wants to win and so on. Uh, one of the things I mentioned earlier is that the, the US has seemed at some point very early in the conflict to be focused not on defending Ukraine, or Ukraine's sovereignty or territoriality. They were, they seem to be focused on the idea that there could be regime change in, in Russia. Right. Have they given up on that, do you think? Or are, is that still a hope? Uh, the ground situation and whatever one is picking up from both the West and from the Russian, I read some Russian media to get an idea. I think support for uh, Mr. Putin is uh, quite strong. Mm -hmm. And there are no centers left there who can challenge him. There was hope that there could be some kind of resistance within 
but that's not happening. And I think presently, uh, unless there is a catastrophic event, uh, this is something that you cannot pin your hopes on. It's like some. It's like a country in South America hoping to have regime change in the United States. It's not possible to do that. So, so my question is, I agree. I totally agree with that. My question is, do Americans refuse to recognize that? I mean, when I say Americans, we don't know who we're talking about. Are we talking about the White House? Or as you mentioned earlier, the Defense Department may have a different position. Are we talking about the political class? Are we talking about Wall Street? Are we talk, or are we talking about the average American who actually knows very little, uh, is, is totally ignorant about all these things? Uh, but the question is, and, and I say this as an American who grew up in the Cold War, is that we were led, we we're always, when there, when there was a conflict, we we're led to believe that there's some kind of objective that can be achieved. Uh, in the case of Vietnam, uh, it was to prevent communism from taking over an entire country um, and presumably to impose a Western regime. Uh, but that would have been possible. You, you could say that the, the Vietnamese regime of Ho, Ho Chi Minh was not a solid political entity that could have been challenged and the West could have realized its vision. And at some point, it's true that the Americans realized that wasn't possible. They'd gone in the wrong di direction and they have hung on as long as they could, even after the Paris negotiations, um, to prolong the war until they, they just happened to give up. Are we seeing the same, will we see the same kind of thing in Ukraine? Because there was this belief, and that it's still maintained, as we can see, in cert among certain officials and in the media, that we can weaken Russia, we can change the landscape of Eastern Europe, and get Russia out of the picture as a political player. It, what you're saying, and what I see, and uh, admit so many other observers say, that that's impossible. That's not going to happen. At what point does that make sense for Americans? And at what point does that change their policy? Is it just, are they just going to hang on as long as possible and pull out? Or will they, yeah. will they make some kind of decision and, and say, it's time to solve this problem? You know, um, I follow both the media and the alternate media in the United States. And there are growing voices, some very credible voices who understand clearly what is happening. And they are actually saying that two things. One, one that the administration and Wall Street is not being fair to the American people. They are not putting up the facts as they should. And so there is a media blitz that is trying to capture the mind. But the alternate media is picking up and there are sharp uh, remarks on the alternate media. And uh, I think uh, if you look at it, anything is possible. Firstly, the strategic aim that they set for themselves, uh, I would say knowing what Russia is, uh, a fortress economy has everything. The economic sanctions haven't worked. In fact, the life of the common man is far better than what it was before. Secondly, look at how the Americans or the United States has uh, turned the uh, world face. You take Afghanistan. Who could have imagined that they would strike a deal with the Taliban and withdraw in humiliation? Same in Vietnam, same in Iraq. So I think uh, there is a feeling that uh, this war is not hurting America like the previous wars have. And therefore, in the long run, if they can start diminishing Russia to whatever extent, it is, uh, let's say, favorable for their geopolitical assessments and such like things. 
But I feel that strategically there hasn't been a debate. What has happened today in the last 30 years since the end of the Cold War? I think uh, the West could have come to a reasonable agreement with Russia. And with what they have done, they have kept poking this bear and have driven it almost into the Chinese arms. So today, strategically, I think uh, the situation could, is, could have been better if it was handled in the right way. And uh, I hope uh, the elections, once they get over, I am sure there will be a pragmatic review. But, uh, you know, there is also a feeling that the strong lobby of the military-industrial complex in America is benefiting the most. In fact, they seem to be the oh. only ones who are benefiting. And therefore, they don't want this thing to stop. And so long as American lives are not at stake, and it's the Ukrainians who are being cannon fodder, then I think uh, we could even see this war rolling into the next year. I don't know. Yeah, uh, what you say, I find really intriguing that um, you, I don't know if that's what you were implying, that the Americans didn't realize that the war would actually help Russia and improve the economic conditions of the average right. Russian. Uh, and that what surprises me in that is that is when I grew up learning history in the United States, if, if, if we, if, if my teachers told me very clearly that Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt did wonderful things to stabilize a country that was in total disarray after the, the crash of 1929. But he didn't manage to get the country going in any serious way. It actually took off and the, the, the US became a, an economic power thanks to the, its involvement in the Second World War and the military economy. And then 20 years later, what, what do we see? We see a president like Dwight Eisenhower who leaves office warning people that this machine that had permitted the uh, that had permitted the, the the growth of the American economy and the and the and and the creation of what people call the Pax Americana had now was now in danger of taking over the whole culture of the country, Absolutely. whole political culture. Uh, Americans should have. Uh, uh, we all knew that giving a country the the opportunity to build itself militarily and be effective in that operation is the best recipe for comforting its economy rather than destroying it. Right. So what astonishes me is that what, you, what you're describing, and I can see this, is that Americans have not realized that they, they didn't manage to take that fact from history and transpose it to the situation of Russia. And what they've done, is, and, and of course, you know, John Mearsheimer said this 10 years ago, yes. that he couldn't understand how the NATO policy of expansion into Ukraine in 2014-15 was uh, made any sense because it was pushing Russia into the arms of China and doing exactly what Nixon didn't want to do and, did, and, and tried rather successfully to avoid, and that is having the two communist parties, the two communist countries, powerful com communist countries, potentially powerful, working together, keep them apart and America can, can rule the world. Uh, a strange thing, uh, Peter, is that uh, sometimes you are left to wonder, is anybody held accountable in America for whatever is done, right? Uh, so you've taken positions which have gone, for example, you take Afghanistan. I think uh, you take Iraq. The whole offensive was built on, let's say, not very truthful grounds. And uh, nobody was brought to the park. Uh, 
uh, is it because it's the administration of the day that has a worldview which uh, the common American man is not interested. He's interested in different things which affect his life. And he just leaves it to the administration of the day to pursue what they want. The architect of this uh, whole business in Ukraine at the lower level, of course, was Victoria Nuland. Uh, she's left now. She's teaching in some university. Columbia. Columbia. <laughs> yes. So the point is that the um, U.S. is a very, very powerful country. There is no doubt in that. And they are uh, powerful in ways which others can't imagine. But I feel that a change of tack is required in the way they see their, in, in the way they view the world. Today, the world is moving away from Pax Americana. I think there are voices. You take the case of India. I think India is very friendly to America. The common people of India, their dream always was to get to America. But India has not taken a blind position. Our hierarchy, the prime minister, our foreign minister, have taken a very pragmatic position, which is in India's interest. And like both of them said, when Mr. Zelensky told them that uh, you are being neutral, they said, no, we are being neutral because we want peace. We are not here to prolong the war. This war should end, and that's what I, uh, you know, my opening statement. That, was. That's what Modi said to uh, Putin then, the first time they met at the beginning of the war. Yes, and India has uh, very discreetly offered its services in whatever manner, along with a group of other countries, to help the two sides uh, get together and solve this issue. It is. Uh, if you were to ask me who's benefiting from this, the only people who seem to be benefiting is the American military industrial complex, as President Eisenhower said. And I think it's in the interest of the world. There are a whole lot of collateral issues that are arising because of this conflict. And I think we now need to see a seriousness in approaching this conflict. It's just come out that the Istanbul Accord was initial and then it was at the instance of America that Mr. Johnson went there and uh, got Doesn't it back. Victoria Newland who admitted that. She's admitted it recently. And that's why I said, is there any accountability at all or you can do what you like? And that's how it is. I think that's the real drama of American democracy is that it's built in such a way that uh, uh, given the economic system, the capitalist economic system, it, it, it's built in such a way that powerful economic interests who are invisible in, in politics, they don't appear, they, they, they fund campaigns and so on, uh, but nobody sees what they're doing and how they're making decisions and how they're supporting policies. Uh, those, they, they get in the, in the position of being able to determine the, the, the policies that are being made. How do you define accountability? Because it's a politician who's going to, it's the Congress itself that's going to legislate. Then it's yes. the executives who will validate and, and implement a, a, a policy. There's no way the voters, who have the only power they have is to say, I'll vote for this party or that party or this person. They have no way of understanding what the link is between how a decision was made and the person who made it. Right. And that's why the person who made it can always say, well, I had no other choice. And that's the way it looked at the time. So we did it that way. So now vote for me because I will do something else. That means there's no continuity. And this is what I was saying about history itself. We know about the history. We know how history works, not in all cases, but there are patterns that are discernible. And if you don't reflect and say, 
if you do this in such a circumstance, if you create a, a conflict which, if, which, which obliges a country to invest in its military, you're actually helping that country rather right. than rather than weakening it. Uh, so th this is the the, the uh, uh, for me uh, a, a very deep seated problem in American political culture is exactly what you're saying that there's no it's built in such a way that there cannot be accountability. There's no way you can say somebody made this happen and had a reason for making it happen and must account for whatever comes out of that. Peter, I don't know if you are aware that I am one of the very few officers who has trained in the Soviet Union at the Tank Academy for a year and then with NATO and did my staff college in UK, Kimberley, uh, at the height of Cold War. So one has uh, a fairly good uh, interest and knowledge about both sides and uh, more um, about the military leaders, giant military leaders in World War II and thereafter. But today, when I look from here, the present crop of leadership uh, falls um, slightly low. Uh, as far as speaking truth to power is concerned. I'm surprised that while strategists, academics in America have spoken uh, somewhere close to reality, haven't found too many people in uniform, those who have retired, speaking truth to power. And I think uh, it's part of this whole military industrial complex which engulfs everyone and so they all follow a one particular line okay there, uh, your remarks earlier about how the global south uh, reacts to everything that's going on and how it it's it, it's taken a where it's its view is very different is totally opposed to the the, the view that's been created by western media raises another question for me in terms of what's going on today. Next month, uh, there, the, there will be the, the BRICS summit. In, right. in, um, BRICS uh, represents, uh, uh, well, it represents some kind of force, which is, is not easy to, to define. How do you see the, the, the possible influence of BRICS on what's going on today, and the and the resolution of not only not only this problem, the problem of Ukraine, we've got the Middle East as well. Is is there anything that's likely to happen soon? We can see it happening slowly, but is there anything likely to happen soon? And what is the role of BRICS? Uh, Peter, I think uh, people in the South are beginning to realize that they don't want to be caught up in the superpower conflicts that have been waged. And while uh, America still holds the pride of place as far as power and influence is concerned, slowly there are voices that are rising as to how American exceptionalism, how American strategy has uh, affected our lives and the alternate uh, mode an alternate view that is emerging is that you cannot allow a unilateral world anymore. And therefore, BRICS is an attempt to have a multilateral kind of world vision where a large number of countries, now you look at BRICS, uh, they represent bulk of the population of the world. Their economy uh, is, uh, if you combine the people who are members, is training to compete with uh, what is uh, EU. I think it's 37% of the world. Right, 37%. And there is a long list of countries that is beginning to want to join BRICS. Because I think uh, they find that their interests are better protected being part of BRICS then, and um, let me say, the EU 
has uh, lost its uh, appeal to most countries. America, whether you like it or not, <laughs> you have to learn that that's the most, you have to live with the thought that's the most powerful country. But people are beginning to challenge unilateralism. And I think we will see, I don't see there will be a, let's say, sudden challenge uh, from the BRICS, but slowly the weight of BRICS as far as economy is concerned. Slowly, the weight of BRICS, as far as world institutions is concerned, is going to make its presence felt. And I think we are looking at a world which is multilateral, no longer unilateral. Yes, but what we're also seeing is, is a resistance to the idea that, uh, on the American side, that that unilateral role should be challenged. Because there's a, you can see it in the in the discourse of uh, Tony Blinken that when he talks about uh, the rules-based order, it's a rules-based order where the rule book has been written and, and yep. been applied for the last 40 years by the US. So, so what uh, people in the global south are beginning to say is who's written the rules? We want yep. fair rules that are not just in the interest of ABC but in our interest as well. And I think uh, this is going to take shape, but may not be immediate, but uh, slowly you look at the sanctions and alternate economy has prospered. And Russia is beginning to do because there is a demand and supply question. Europe needs Russian oil, Russian gas. All that they are beginning to do is to not get it directly, but indirectly and pay much more for it. Yeah. So that's the reality. We have to get to, uh, you take the case of India. A uh, lot of people, and I think our uh, foreign minister had explained it very brilliantly to say that uh, India is a net importer of petroleum products. And it's we have to look at our interests. If despite sanctions, Europe is beginning to continue to import Russian uh, oil products in an indirect way, how can Russia forego, how can India not take uh, the opportunity to get this product at a cheaper rate? That's what we have been doing. So I think uh, nations will continue to challenge. The American unilateralism uh, is uh, not going to vanish, but will get diminished as we move into the future. The China is a dark horse. Uh, you know, uh, there is a, and uh, India and China have the largest trade, uh, yet we have a conflict uh, that is, uh, simmering in Latak. Yeah. So, uh, but it's been capped and I hope the two countries are able to, we will be able to resolve it because we realize you can't have two of the world's most populous countries fighting each other. Hmm. No, that I, I think there are enough reasonable people on both sides to say that, and, and with, and people who take into account their knowledge of history, which is what I'm complaining about with the U.S. is I, if, if Americans would just listen to their own historians, right? They they might be able to do things in a in a more rational way, and ones that do not lead to what we now accept as a as a fact of nature that there are forever wars. Uh, the, the idea of having the adjective forever before a war, nobody would have ever thought of that but for the last 30 years that's what we've been looking at is Absolutely. a system of forever wars which means permanent conflict which means that you're focusing on the areas where conflict can exist as between India and China you could say everything's about the border um, or you're talking about the kind of economic and political and geopolitical co cooperation that can make 
that it can defend the interests of both countries without oh, very, very secure. Right, absolute win-win situation. So, uh, so my question about BRICS is: we're, we're watching it evolve in a way in ways that people are not that don't that people don't see as dramatically influencing the events in the world. Uh, but we've talked about the military dimension of the unipolar world, but there's also the economic, uh, the financial side, and that is the role of the dollar, which which is where right. BRICS is really making inroads, because the dollar is not being challenged directly, but indirectly, and being removed slowly as the the bloodline of of the the global economy. Right. Absolutely. Um... I think uh, the next decade or so would be crucial for how the world evolves in the future. Let's just, uh, let me just uh, give you a thought. I think the world bodies need restructuring. It's clear to everyone. You look at the United, United Nations Security Council, the P5. Can you imagine the country with the largest population in the world, a rising economy, uh, all good institutions, is not a member. Whereas we are having legacy members based on World War II. Yes. No, it's, I, mean, it's a, uh, I mean, that's a, just a, it's a scandalous idea when you, when you think about it. But again, uh, people consider this to be the normal state of things, the status quo, the idea, I think, in a lot of people's minds is that the system, the American system, worked for 50 years or 70 years, whatever, however you want to count it. Uh, so why should we be challenging it? Why should we even think that it's time to readjust uh, things, uh, readjust the rules of the game? Because uh, you know, the world is not the same. When exactly. the system was designed, it has changed. Look at where China was. Look at where India was. Look at where Brazil was. Look at where South Africa was. And today, these countries are rising economically. India and China also are militarily strong. So there is, a, and uh, you know, you can't have proxy members of the UN Security Council who just ditto what one part says and i think sooner than later this will have to be restructured and uh, to but you can see that's a real resistance because people people are there is resistance but uh, one to one every country including us russia uk france germany everybody acknowledges that india must have a seat on the high table yet they create conditions where you can't move forward. So extra claimants come in. Somebody from Africa wants to come. Somebody from South America wants to come. So uh, the situation is created where the move forward is timing. But I think you can't stop a country like India, you know, the largest uh, population, a rising economic power has all other attributes, including a peaceful nuclear capability. Yes. India has an open doctrine on this. And therefore, I think a lot of countries are beginning, at least in the global south, are beginning to look towards India as somebody who will, if not be their leader, will at least show the way forward in a, in a yes. mutually beneficial way. Yes, I, I think anyone who just sits down and tries to seriously analyze it will come to exactly the same conclusion. The problem is that today the power lies with the current uh, Security Council, which has an entire right over everything to the but, extent yeah. that its members have a veto. Um, and so they can veto anything that... Yeah, any but the question is, has the Security Council come with a solution for any protracted problem? No. no, because... no but that's, that's where I say rational people agree on this. Yes. But, uh, but there, there's an irrational... My, my question, my real question is, 
does it require some kind of really dramatic, catastrophic thing? More I intense, think, more intense than just a border war. Or yeah, I think, uh, Peter, uh, the Ukraine war is just too far out into Europe to effect. And uh, I think it is between two nuclear powers, one a proxy and the other actually fighting. Yeah. But I think uh, a situation is developing in the Middle East with uh, Israel, the Palestinians, yeah. Iran, and, and Iran. Yeah. yeah, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, UAE. And uh, so far, we haven't crossed the Rubicon. But you don't know how things, one particular incident can engulf the whole region. And if Middle East uh, explodes, the world will be affected. And yeah. I think that's at present the catastrophic uh, possibility one could look at. I hope it doesn't happen and better sense prevails on yes. all sides. I think we, we well, well, we'll close on that note, I think, of optimism. Uh, it seems to me that something dramatic has to happen, but it doesn't have to be catastrophic. Uh, yes. You evoked the possibility at the very beginning of our conversation of, uh, of nuclear war. Uh, World War III, um, and we see that we've, I, I, I suppose you would agree that we, we've we never been closer. I mean, I lived through the, uh, through the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. I was in high school at the time, um, and that was a very frightening experience for us Americans. Uh, we could see the mushroom clouds exploding in our own neighborhoods in our minds we, it, it was it was reality that what's surprising today is that people are not they don't they don't have that imagination to see Absolutely. that they are on the brink of doing I, it doesn't invoke the same concerns in the new generation which uh, actually is also in part in fact to that extent uh, one leader who gets uh, admired for his uh, straight talk is the Hungarian Prime Minister. Absolutely, Orban. Uh, he has earned a lot of admirers, at least yeah. in India, with his straight, blunt talk of what we could get into. And I'm surprised some of the very small countries like the Baltic states, uh, you know, the East Europeans, some in Europe, smaller countries, uh, even two big countries, France and Germany, talk of uh, this uh, in a slightly light-hearted manner. Yeah. You know, the seriousness of, uh, because there is a line which should never be approached, leave alone, crossed. If you cross that line once, then events go out of control. And there are enough sane people in the world who are cautioning on this. Yeah. And I hope uh, deep down, most people in authority are also aware. I hope so. Yeah. Well, the, the danger seems to be more acute in the Middle East, where you have someone like Netanyahu, is, who's even less reasonable than and right. uh, Zelensky, uh, and uh, who, whose culture, uh, their, mil their military culture uh, is, seems to me far more dangerous than anything else we've seen. Uh, you talked about earlier that both Russia and the US have shown considerable restraint, right. even while pursuing the, the conflict. Uh, but there are some people who may not feel restrained. And I, I don't know if you'd agree that uh, there's a parallel between the Middle East situation and Ukraine in, 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 insofar as you, you have two leaders, Netanyahu and Zelensky, who are trying to get the U.S. involved. involved. Absolutely. And, and that brings us to, to a real brink if, if that takes place. Uh, and uh, so at what point do they become desperate 
at what point does their decision making include the idea? Well, we it's it's you know all or nothing. Let's let's go. Let me before we finish, Peter. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Because uh, you have a pole position to look at this whole thing. How does Mr. Putin's actions come out? A lot of people think that he has been quite restrained. He has been quite uh, balanced in his approach, has not reacted to various provocations that keep going periodically, assassinations, bombings, uh, other things. And um, I think uh, that's one of the reasons that uh, we haven't crossed a particular line. What is yes. your view? Well, that's my, totally my view. Uh, and I'm aware that there are uh, people in the Russian hierarchy who are saying, well, it's about time to get this, get the job done. We know that we're winning. Let's just show them that we we can we can do it and that that is a red line that will be seen as a red line for the americans uh so who crosses it first uh, i don't know but i but my impression is that putin has been very restrained now if you read the western press they say the only reason putin has been restrained is that he's frightened we have sufficient we have intimidated him we've with our power with our in, with our capability. Uh, he doesn't dare to to do anything. So we need to continue the, the battle. Uh, and I think that's just totally wrong. Uh, but if you look at any of the mainstream people in the news, uh, the way they describe it is, is that that's the way Kamala Harris described it uh, in the debate, saying it was thanks to our action that Putin did not conquer Ukraine and is not going to conquer Europe. Uh, I don't think they have any designs on Europe. <laughs> no, there's no, there's absolutely no evidence of it. There's nothing you can cite materially that yes. that shows that there was that there's anything, any ambition to conquer, even to conquer your Ukraine. Uh, yeah. And as, as you said, the Istanbul, well, in December 2021, uh, Putin put forward a, a right. security framework that they could agree on to avoid war. Right. Uh, so so if you talk, but nobody talks about security, uh, about, uh, about security on both sides. Uh, right. So, um, Anyway, well, this has been a, a really interesting discussion, and I've learned quite a lot. Thanks Thank to you. your military insight, which I have none of. Um, and um, it was great talking to you, and I hope we can... My pleasure. Join the conversation at Fair Observer and subscribe to our YouTube channel.